Item number SCP-2480 Object Class Presumed Neutralized Special Containment Procedures Dimensional Research Site-13 was constructed adjacent to Bodfield Manor, location of the SCP-2480 anomaly. Civilians are to be prevented from accessing the Bodfell estate through nonviolent means. Class A, B, and C amnestics may be used at the discretion of field agents. Foundation personnel have been integrated with the community surrounding SCP-2480 as quarantine or relocation of inhabitants has been deemed unfeasible. Considered the best source of information for SCP-2480 anomalies, agents are to make local inquiries and investigate any rumors, reports, or claims of an anomalous nature. Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6 Village Idiots have infiltrated the community and are to remain on the lookout for anomalous manifestations. Mobile Task Force Psi-9 Abyss Gazers is to remain on standby in case of an emanation event. The use of force has been authorized, and anomalous manifestations are to be destroyed without prejudice. SCP-2480 is speculated to be a dimensional anomaly located in a coastal and heavily forested town with just over 9,000 residents. SCP-2480 was allegedly created by accident when agents from the Global Occult Coalition interrupted a ritual on November 28, 1952. While the true purpose of this ritual remains unknown to date, the Foundation has concluded the anomaly to be the result of the inept and heavy-handed approach of GOC operatives. SCP-2480 appears to be centered around Bodfield Manor, home of the late Cornelius P. Bodfield III, birth date 1866 to 1952, millionaire industrialist with an acute interest in the occult. Prior to his death. Bodfell was the leader of a secret society known as Aditum's Wake. Dismissed by the Foundation in 1932 as simply being a decadent, upper-class social club, their anomalous capabilities were not recognized until the November 28, 1952 incident. Due to the critical failure of their mission, there were no surviving GOC operatives to be properly interrogated. However, documents were subsequently recovered from a GOC safe house located in it appears that the GOC attempted to destroy these documents prior to their mission. A torn report, lower half missing with a photograph attached via paperclip, was discovered in the back of a fireplace along with significant ash. It is assumed that all other documents had been incinerated. KTE-042-Black Threat ID KTE-042-Black Date 1966 Authorized Response Level 4. Severe Threat. Liquidation Pending. Description: KTE-0452-Black, hereafter referred to as Subject, is a humanoid threat entity of variable appearance. Subject most often appears in priestly vestments and carrying a staff. Subject is able to disappear and reappear at will, shape and manipulate organic material, bend reality see Document 37B, and is hypothesized to be biologically immortal. While subject is classified as humanoid, they are not believed to be human. Whether they ever were is still debatable. Psychological profile indicates malignant narcissism and megalomania. Subject is believed to have aided in the creation of Sarkic cults throughout much of the world. See On Sarkicism for further details. It has been verified that GOC operatives intended to assassinate POI-93. As POI-93 was not discovered among the dead, it can be surmised that the GOC did not achieve their primary goal. The Foundation became aware of SCP-2480 after intercepting and decoding a GOC distress broadcast, prompting sending an investigative team. Thirty-six corpses were found scattered throughout the estate, eight of which were later identified as GOC operatives. All but five displayed anomalous cause of death such as implosion, disintegration, and fatal physical reconfiguration. SCP-2480 is hypothesized to be a dimensional anomaly that cannot be directly perceived. This cognitohazardous effect interferes with perception in such a way that only through the use of perception-altering chemicals and or the direct and sustained observation of its effects on local reality it may be detected. 
Reality alterations were subtle and restricted to bot-filled manner, manifesting as impossible interior dimensions, interior larger than exterior would suggest, non-Euclidean architecture, and additional rooms and corridors that did not previously exist. SCP-2480 has been classified as safe. Addendum. The investigation of Bodfield Manor uncovered disconcerting evidence with regards to Cornelius P. Bodfield III and the organization known as Additum's Wake. Based on several meticulously kept journals and a collection of photographs, Bodfield and his followers would frequently host orgies that included rape, pedophilia, ritual human sacrifice, and cannibalism. Discovered within the journals were sermon notes and guest lists whose names have included affluent families, respected politicians, leaders of industry, and even those of religious authority. Among Bodfield's belongings was a handwritten tome containing religious scripture. His journals frequently reference this book as the Valkzeron. The writing system has yet to be deciphered. The Grand Hall contains a marble statue depicting an entity with a leonine head and a vermiform body. This statue was later studied by Dr. Judith Lowe, Senior Advisor at the Department of History, Religious GOI Threat Analysis, and confirmed to be a representation of the Demiurge among certain Gnostic sects. The Demiurge, also known as Yaldabaoth, Sarklos, or Samuel, has no history of being presented with reverence, and is believed to be a figure of worship for Adatum's wake. At the base of the statue, written in Greek, are the words. Desire is the measure of all things. Be unbound for moral tethers. Do as you will, to whom you will. In mid-1988, Simon Oswalt, director of Site-13, failed to send a biannual report on the state of SCP-2480, which had no reported changes since its original containment. The Foundation, believing it to be a bureaucratic error, attempted to contact Site-13 directly without response. Initially, Agent Samuel Rowe and Agent Sarah Valentine were sent to investigate, but neither agent has since made contact, and their fate remains unknown at this time. Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6, Village Idiots, was dispatched to in order to re-establish contact with Site-13 and properly secure SCP-2480. Members of Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6 were able to successfully integrate themselves into the community as new residents or tourists. Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6 Surveillance Operations Superfluous data expunged for the sake of brevity, listing logs relevant to the SCP-2480 anomaly. Mission Log Agent Myron Goldstein, Day 6 Cliché as it sounds, I've been starting to detect a certain wrongness here. Is it anything I can actually pinpoint to? In another place, I'd probably dismiss this thought immediately. Last night I saw a man mowing his lawn at midnight. Strange behavior, but not itself an anomaly. Maybe just eccentric. This morning I noticed a man staring me down at the fish market. His eyes never blinked once. There is a smell, too. Not fish, not the sea. Subtle but pungent all the same. Mission Log Agent Adam Grayson, Day 11 I'm not comfortable in this hotel one bit. You can hear people running about at all hours of the night. Can't get any sleep. Keep checking the damn peephole. Last night decided to check it one last time before heading to bed. Saw a face. Couldn't tell if it was a man or woman. But as soon as I looked, they started to slam their head against the door over and over. Over and over. They just wouldn't stop. Mission Log Agent Emma Lightbody, Day 16 I don't know what command is waiting for. Our target is Bodful Estate, but they stayed their hand so far. Maybe know something we don't. A nervous-looking man approached me on the street, reeked of whiskey but his tone was sincere, asked me if I was a Fed, lied and said I was, I was able to get some info, talked about monsters in the fog, screaming their secrets, he said, no idea what he meant by it, said it's been like this for over forty years. They found him dead the very next day. Locals claimed he drowned. This town is full of liars. Mission Log Agent Frank Giuseppe, Day 20 Fog is thick here, always raining. Even the trees look sad. Like they're stuck in autumn or something. Too much gray, not enough green. The locals don't talk much, seem to keep to themselves. Strange for a supposed vacation destination. The majority of folks don't seem to ever smile. Look damn tired too, some even sickly. 
My first weird encounter was today. Saw a bunch of kids gathered on the street around dusk. Thought they were playing a game, but as soon as they noticed me, they scattered, leaving behind what had their attention. It was a dead dog. Looked like a black lab, actually. Had one of the lad, and seeing it nearly brought me to tears. Hit my weak spot, I guess. I've seen plenty of human corpses. Never felt a thing. That wasn't really the odd part. It would be one thing if they were poking it with a stick. I mean, kids get curious and all. But no. This was different. Poor critter was partially flayed and covered in bite marks. Big chunks torn from it. Those kids were having a goddamn snack out here. Mission Log Agent Emma Lightbody, Day 30 Giuseppe and I decided to do some exploration. Plenty of abandoned buildings to choose from. Decided to check out a two-story house by the waterfront. The inside wasn't quite what we were expecting. The interior was covered in gibberish and symbols. Odd, but not anomalous. Another notable detail was in the living room. Had one of those tiny screen TVs, the sort you'd see in the 50s and 60s. There are four TV dinner trays, still standing and holding half-eaten meals, decayed beyond recognition. What family abandons their home and all their belongings in the middle of dinner? Thought we caught a glimpse of someone. Chased them upstairs but never found anyone. Giuseppe thinks we were chasing our own shadows. Maybe he was right. We'll check out another place tomorrow. Maybe secure us a proper anomaly. Mission Log Agent Reese Maynard Day 37 Seven days. Seven days without any word from Giuseppe. Lightbody said they had plans to rendezvous in an old mill, but he never showed. Did a sweep of his place and found a few things of interest. All the doors were locked, windows too. DNA and fingerprints gathered at the scene matched no one but Giuseppe. The TV was left on. We have nothing to go on. It's like he ceased to exist. Mission Log Agent Harold Mason Day 39 The others underestimate the dive bar scene in this town. Some think you can't trust a drunk to offer proper intel, but they're wrong. Just have to filter out the noise. Besides, the inebriated seem to be the only honest folk here and easy to bleed for information. Chatted up a cute native, loosened her lips with a few drinks, got nothing of value, at least with regards to information. Conversed with an old fisherman, looked like he's seen some rough living. Rambled a lot, started sobbing about lost siblings, said Bodfield took two sisters and a brother. Questioned him more but couldn't give him the answer if he meant the estate or the dead millionaire himself. Guess he was old enough for the latter. Saw the original report in the mission briefing. Bod fell with a sick fuck. I doubt the whole cult died with him either. Man was delirious by the end. Said the town had a god-shaped hole in it. Couldn't get him to elaborate. Mission Log Agent Myron Goldstein Day 40 Agent Grayson is dead. I can't say exactly what I saw, but it was enough for me to know that he didn't make it. We were having a few beers at the docks, comparing notes. Said he felt like he was being followed. Told him we were all feeling something like that. His eyes were bloodshot from lack of sleep, kept twitching too. It all happened so fast. I felt the hairs on my neck rise. The air smelled of thunder. Assumed a storm was brewing. I saw Grayson's eyes widen, and in an instant he was turned to slurry hit by some invisible force. There I was, covered in blood and bile, the small chunks of Grayson spilling into the harbor. Through it all I felt a presence. Whatever it was, I think it wanted me to know how easily it could do this to me too. I don't know why it spared me. A crowd looked on from a distance. A few twisted their lips into a plastic smile, but most averted their gaze, lowered their heads and went back to their daily routine. I wish we could just raise this place and have it all done with. Experimental Research Statement of Dr. Calixto Norvez Surveillance of Revealed patterns of possible significance. This includes Excessive procreation. The average household having 12 children, a number unsupported by census data. Approximately 80% of children born over the last 30 years lack birth certificates or social security numbers. Local inquiries have failed to ascertain why this might be. I suspect religious reasoning, similar to the quiverful. Cognitive impairment. Many residents appear to have difficulty with memory retention and subsyndromal delirium, mental fatigue. Subtle hallucinations are not uncommon. Drug abuse. The community appears to consume approximately 200% more alcohol than the statewide average. 
the use of hallucinogens is seemingly non-existent. Disappearances The number of disappearances within the vicinity of is the highest in the state. This has been blamed on geographical features such as dense forest and marshland by local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. The actual number of missing is speculated to be much higher, involving the unreported disappearances of the transients and local residents. Suspicious deaths Many local fatalities suggest foul play and possibly anomalous causes of death. All such deaths have been recorded as accidental or suicide, even when contradictory evidence is provided to law enforcement. Example, a woman was discovered with her body structurally inverted. Police concluded her state to be self-inflicted, although this would be impossible. Apathy. An unusual malaise affects the town, as should readily be apparent from the previous examples of abnormalities. From my experience with SCP and SCP, I hypothesize that we are dealing with an anomaly beyond our senses and that of our technology. One capable of creating a facsimile of baseline reality, invisible but not entirely intangible. Request access to NN dimethyltryptamine. Previous experiments with human perception have yielded positive results from NN DMT. A requisition form has been filed and awaits proper authorization. To better explain the reasoning behind my request, in 1976 I was sent to investigate Brazil a community displaying abnormalities akin to those related to SCP-2480. I eventually came in contact with an indigenous tribe in the southern part of the Brazilian Amazon, a people unaffected but surprisingly aware of the anomaly. Introduced to their shaman, I learned of the aberrations that lurked beyond mortal sight. The tribe had many words for these entities, but the most common could be translated as, none stand where they do, and were associated with a condition known as soul sickness. They were viewed as distinct from the spirits of their animist traditions, a living wound on nature brought to their land by colonists. Their shaman showed me Yopo, and I experienced the world as they saw it. At the time, I merely dismissed it as a hallucination. DMT is commonly held to be a hallucinogen. This is demonstrably false, as noted with my experiments with SCP. It is a perception enhancer, allowing us to sense that which evolution has strangely seen fit to obscure. DMT, when properly administered, should be able to activate this normally dormant level of perception for anyone. To put it simply, it removes our perceptional filters so that we might perceive reality for what it really is. DMT Testing 1 I, Dr. Narvez, entered the town center at 0900 with an inhaler containing 60 mg of DMT and a concealed radio and video feed connected directly to my assistant, Dr. Wu. I intend to use the first hour to observe my surroundings before administering DMT. I inhaled the DMT. Within approximately one minute, I experienced a tingling numbness throughout my body. Colors have become more vivid, and soon a yellow fog cloaks the town. I see people in dark hooded robes, their outfits appearing to be composed of poorly stitched together leathers and hides. I cannot see their faces, and I feel instinctively that I must not look upon them. The majority of locals appear surprisingly normal. They move around or stand aside when the hooded figures approach. Never do they make eye contact. Wu informs me of this odd behavior, noting that the locals appear to be evading something unseen. I continue to explore. I now see that the buildings are in a state of ruin, covered in a pulsating, fleshy material. Wu states that they look perfectly normal to him. I see a drainage system. A black fluid flows through it and carries with it an amber sheen. Wu cannot see it whatsoever. A church in the center of town had been completely replaced by a black ziggurat. The cowed entities prostrate themselves before the structure. I must assume that it holds religious significance. I see a robed entity in the distance. They are abnormally tall and hold several unknown creatures by a leash. I examine the leash more closely. Its composition not unlike that of intestines. The creatures have small, unblinking eyes. Their mouths display several rows of needle-like teeth. Their flesh is sickly pale yet muscular. They gibber madly and move with a frenzied pace. Wu tells me that he sees a teacher with young students, possibly on a field trip. I observed several of the creatures attack one of their own, its size suggesting it to be the runt of their pack. They rend its flesh with their talons and teeth as it squeals in pain. Wu states that he sees several of the children bullying one another. I avert my eyes, unable to watch more. 
I look skyward and see tall spires, composed of a chitinous-like material, towering over the town. I do not understand their purpose. I require proof that this hidden world is real, but must obtain it without drawing attention to myself. I remove a bottle of water from my satchel and consume it before backtracking to where I had seen the strange liquid. Crouching down, I fill the plastic container with the viscous substance. The other world begins to fade, and I am returned to reality, the effects of the DMT having likely worn off. I turn my eyes to the bottle. It appears empty to my eyes, but I can feel the weight of the liquid. Never before have I experienced anything like this. Besides the organic structures, I recall seeing black banners with a yellow, spiral-like symbol. I felt as though I had seen that glyph before, but its meaning and origin escape recollection. Lab results. Material became visible after its removal from SCP-2480's hypothesized zone of influence. It is black and reflects light with an amber shimmer. Substance of the liquid, although somewhat gelatinous. Microscopic analysis have revealed organelle-like structures resembling free mitochondria in a particularly viscous serum with high levels of unidentified fatty acids. Research is underway. DMT Testing 2 I, Dr. Narvez, accompanied by Agent Lightbody and Agent Goldstein, entered a house that, until recently, was occupied by Agent Giuseppe. Initial investigation showed no evidence as to what might have possibly happened, although foul play is assumed. As was done in my previous experiment, I have a live video feed connected to my assistant, Dr. Wu, and intend to inhale 60 mg of the DMT. After inspecting the building, I administer the DMT. As expected, within approximately one minute, I experience a tingling sensation throughout my body. I now perceive the house as it truly is, decaying, covered in excrement and blood. I can smell it, taste it. I imagine this to be what it is like to bite into a tumor. Better to say a rotten tumor. Tumors are just flesh, after all. In the living room, written on the wall just above the couch, is the phrase, He is dreaming war, Adatum will rise. The meaning of these words are beyond my understanding. There are other symbols, they are in a language I have never seen before, and impossible to decipher. We intend to search the basement. It is an ancient root cellar, on the far end of the large spiral painted on the wall. I feel compelled to inspect it closer. As I draw closer, the wall fades yet the symbol remains as if painted upon empty air. Through this archway are descending stairs. As I enter, Wu informs me that I walked into the wall and the camera went black. There is no wall. There was never a wall. Only a clever illusion. The agents are concerned. They cannot see the way. I tell them to close their eyes and step through as I did. Now all three of us are on the other side. They too see the descending stone stairs. We walk down the stairs and enter a tunnel, into the bowels of the basement's basement. The walls quiver and tremble with life. Porous, they bleed a sap-like material. Contact with Wu is lost. Our GPS devices fail us. Lightbody looks to our compass. The pointer whirls and twirls. The tunnel divides, branching out in many directions. I choose the path to my left. We walk for only a few minutes before reaching a rotted wooden door. I ask the agents if they are able to perceive it as well. They can. We push the door open and enter, only to exit from an old shack of obviously baseline appearance. GPS shows that we are on the entirely opposite side of the town. Contact is re-established with Dr. Wu. We appear to be in a field of some kind, a yellow fog blanketing the land. Dr. Wu and the agents describe the area as likely abandoned farmland, GPS suggesting that we are relatively close to Botfield Estate. I inhale another 60 mg of the DMT, note, research a way to lengthen the effect, and request that Agent Goldstein takes the lead. I feel a sense of dread, but attempt my best to hide it. I hear heavy breathing, even heavier footsteps. The others hear nothing whatsoever. These notes must be done in retrospect. Goldstein regrettably could not see the threat, and I was too slow to react. I mourn his loss, but must describe the encounter in as much detail as possible. I saw the silhouette of a massive humanoid, estimated to be over four meters in height, as it shambled out from the fog. I wanted to scream but attempted to remain calm in order to gather as much data as possible. Physical Description Its flesh was pale and flabby, its face dominated by a large, two-filled mouth, entity lacking visible eyes, ears, or nostrils. Its teeth and three-fingered hands were heavily stained, seemingly caked in viscera. 
The entity charged us, loping like a colossal gorilla. I informed the others that it would be best that we retreat, but it would prove too late for Agent Goldstein. The entity lifted him with a single hand and bit down into his torso, disemboweling him in the process. We serpentined through the fields, unable to find a shack from which we came. I was unarmed, yet I alone had the means to lead. I should have supplied her with DMT, something I deeply regret in retrospect. I could feel the ground beneath my feet quake. Casting my eyes downward, I saw not soil but fragmented flesh, like harlequin-type ichthyosis. With each step I took, the skin splintered and gushed like an infected, pus-filled wound. The ground would soon rupture with slithering, crimson-colored tendrils. They snatched Agent Lightbody by her ankle, pulling her into a hole far too small for any human. I hear her screams and the breaking of her bones. I ran and never looked back. I hope this is enough evidence. I have no wish to return to that place. Access restricted to Level 4 personnel or authorized Citra Archer personnel. An introductory statement by O5-4. SCP-2480 is currently projected to lead to an SK-class dominance shift by the year 2030. We will not allow this to happen. Our predecessors blamed the Global Occult Coalition. We assumed, as always, that we knew better. You have been selected to be a part of Project Citra Artra. Welcome to the Invisible War. Another world is bleeding into ours, an invasive colonization of our iteration of reality. Their soldiers do not experience fear or pain. They know nothing of restraint or mercy. They swirl with rumors, rumors I intend to address. What you have heard is true. Genetic analysis of the enemy has arrived at one conclusion. Mostly human. Do they come from another iteration of our reality? From our future or past? We don't know. They cloak themselves in a facsimile of baseline reality. They will wear the faces of those you love, forcing you to kill, over and over, the very people you are fighting to save. Every word you heard about these abominations is, in all likelihood, absolutely true. There is but one common myth I wish to dispel. These aberrations can be destroyed, despite various falsehoods that claim otherwise. Make no mistake, we will not achieve our objectives without substantial sacrifice. You will see friends and comrades die, devoured by behemoths, sundered by the cries of jabbers, torn to ribbons by fiends. Despite your significant training, the survival rate of Mobile Task Force Psy-9 operatives teeters at approximately 55% during the first month of active duty, a vast improvement over initial rates of mortality. Flesh is their weapon, ours is technology, innovation, and the wisdom of those who came long before us. So few had the vision to recognize the threat. This is our world. These are our people. We can live for ourselves today, or help secure tomorrow for everyone. Project Citra Archer Dossier Introductory Statement Project Citra Archer was conceived by the Foundation and Global Occult Coalition in order to contain and eventually neutralize the threat presented by SCP-2480. Mobile Task Force Psy-9, Abyss Gazers, was formed as a joint task force consisting of personnel from the Foundation and Global Occult Coalition. Mobile Task Force Psy-9 is a battalion strength force trained in unconventional warfare against invading enemies through the use of heavy artillery, DMT-enhanced perception, and counter-occult stratagems, or COS. Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6 will continue working undercover in SCP-2480 infected locations, collecting data which will then be employed in Mobile Task Force Psy-9 operations. This has proven an effective, albeit costly, and significantly dangerous method at preventing the spread of SCP-2480. Please see Document Engagement Protocols SCP-2480-2 through SCP-2480-46 for further details. With the use of DMT, Mobile Task Force Psy-9 operatives are able to perceive their targets. After twelve years of clandestine operations, operating primarily between dusk and dawn in order to limit public exposure, suffering heavy casualties, Mobile Task Force Psy-9 were able to reclaim Bodfill Estate and Site-13. The apprehension of SCP-2480-1, formerly Site Director Simon Oswalt, has greatly diminished, potentially neutralized the threat of SCP-2480. Although still invisible to normal perception, SCP-2480 entities in grew idle, refusing to feed or even defend themselves. 
It is currently hypothesized that SCP-2480-1 controlled SCP-2480 entities via pheromones, its removal causing said entities to become directionless. Several cadavers were discovered impaled to the outer walls of Site-13. Estimated age of the dead and the style of uniforms worn suggested they perished in the early 1960s. Physical examination of SCP-2480-1 revealed significant mutation from baseline Homo sapiens. A vivisection was performed, anesthesia was administered but SCP-2480-1 showed no reaction, although neither did they appear to suffer pain. The subject noted to be absent of all internal organs, save for the brain, lungs, and heart. The brain showed notable deviation, most notably a pineal gland eight times larger than normal. SCP-2480-1 is currently secured at Armed Biological Containment Area 14. SCP-2480-1 Interrogation Interviewed SCP-2480-1 Interviewer Dr. Peter Hull Begin Log 1430 Hello SCP-2480-1, I hope that you are comfortable. I would prefer you address me as Karsis Karvas. Do the protocol. Kozil Zvaz. Don't speak to me at protocol, I know your rules well. State your queries, unwashed one, for I have no interest in your feigned pleasantries. Very well. Although we not yet understand how, the Foundation believes it understands why you disguised the infestation. What was the point of allowing so many to live in the town? Couldn't you have replaced them all? Fresh materials are always in demand. Why would a farmer butcher all of his pigs? The population must be kept alive and encouraged to breed, never deplete a necessary resource. What happened to those that vanished? Pigs are clever animals, you know, intelligent and noble, but pork is delicious, smiles. I, I see. Moving on. How long have you had these anomalous properties? Was it before or after your recruitment to the Foundation? It was soon after my appointment to Site-13, soon after I was made aware of the Foundation's dossier on me. Dullard, it called me, a mirthless bureaucrat without known family or friends. Perfect, it said, to be director at the inconsequential Site-13. That is not nearly enough to justify your traitorous actions. You imaginable imbeciles thought it safe. Heh, <laughs> safe. Please answer the question with regards to your anomaly. A gift from one who saw my full potential. Placing its left hand over his chest, speaking in a referential tone. Cool ion nit solnik bethos. I don't understand. Speak English, please. As belik. Tone suggests profanity. Ion, our immortal father, breaker of chains, his divine shadow, grand carses of Adatum, lords of the Nevermint, Ur priest of the blind god, archon of Ion. That was all I needed. Please do not waste my time with gratuitous titles. Do not interrupt your better. Disobey me and I will have you nailed to the wall with the other heathings. Adatum will rise. Calm down and we'll be forced to. I will make you dance, me puppet. You are a joke to me. SCP-2480-1 breaks its restraints, self-amputating its arms in the process. Entity squirmed on the floor towards the ballistic glass. Security and medical personnel, dressed in protective hazmat, enter the containment unit. Subject is restrained, gagged, and treated for its injuries. Addendum 2480-3 on November 24, 2014, anomalies similar to SCP-2480 were reported in Romania. Investigation is currently ongoing.